This is Dr. Weiss, and this is my narrated PowerPoint of James Joyce. These are uh, general themes that uh, you have come across in the text. I hope that you've come across in the text. And we are going to broadly explore some of these general themes. These themes are not in any specific order. They are not exclusive of one another, and this is not an exhaustive list, but will get us, I think, into thinking about James Joyce's The Dead uh, a little bit more thoroughly. So I'm going to start with this group of themes. I'm going to read them all together and uh, talk about them for a few moments. Rur rural Ireland versus urban Ireland. Um, Dublin is the biggest, smallest city in Europe. And there is a separation in terms of how people think about Dublin versus the rest of Ireland. It was this way in the early 20th century, and I think for the most part it is this way now, although there are some other large cities now uh, or other cities in Ireland that have grown uh, quite a bit, such as Galway and Cork and maybe a couple of others. But Dublin is considered, uh, it's very urban, it's cosmopolitan, it's uh, new, it's progressive, uh, in many ways, and uh, there is, a, I think, a clear separation between the urban environment and all of those things that the urban environment represents and the very rural environment of the West uh, of Ireland, in particular the West of Ireland. And we see this, um, you know, sort of framed with a different set of values, not unlike that we might have, let's say, in the United States with uh, big urban cities. Uh, all over the United States and a kind of antagonism in some ways with those that might live in less populated areas. Uh, so we see that in Ireland. And this is seen in the very relationship of the uh, two main characters of this text between Gabriel and Greta. Greta comes from Galway. So there's a kind of antagonism here that people from Galway in the west of Ireland, and by the way, if you ever have an opportunity to go, you can take the train from Dublin to Galway. It's about two and a half hours. You go straight across the countryside. It's absolutely beautiful. Galway uh, is a beautiful town. It was uh, much smaller uh, the first time I was there in the early 90s. Uh, just a couple of years ago, I had an opportunity to visit again. And um, it's grown up quite a bit. Two big universities there, and um, uh, they have a Planet Fitness. So what else? What else do you need, right? Um, <clears throat> but you know, in Dublin, uh, urban uh, with with suburbs and, and that sort of thing. Looking at the West, um, people might consider those that come from the West backward or uneducated, and so there's that sort of tension here. Uh, because Greta comes from the West, and people here might look at Greta as somebody that doesn't necessarily belong here. So there's this concern for the, uh, for the decline of Irish values and Irish culture. Um, there's, uh, there's an antagonism then within Ireland and between Ireland and the continent, or Ireland and England. And this is seen, I think, very clearly in the interaction that Gabriel has with Ms. Ivers, where Ms. Ivers identifies that Gabriel is a writer for a magazine uh, that writes uh, uh, subject matter uh, on literature, but pertaining more so uh, to the European continent, that Gabriel is not interested in visiting Galway. And when Greta finds out there's talk of visiting Galway, she gets excited because she wants to visit her people. But Gabriel is interested in things that are more modern, things that are more urban, things that are more fashionable, like galoshes. And this becomes a source of humiliation for Gabriel because galoshes are something that you put over your shoes in wet weather. And um, uh, Greta makes fun of him. And this is representative of not only a kind of divide within their marriage, but also Gabriel's interest in things that are more European rather than uh, in Ireland, which he considers in general uh, a little bit too constraining, too oppressive, and backward. 
Um, so the traditional Irish values, what does the text suggest in general about Irish values, about uh, the trajectory of Irish history? Really, that it's dead. I mean, that is the title of this short story. And uh, you should start with the title of any short story or any novel uh, as a way to help inform your reading or how it might frame your understanding of the text. We see this here in the very first paragraph. Who is the young lady that is helping Gabriel and Greta when they arrive? Lily, the caretaker's daughter. What is a lily? A lily is a flower. In what context might a lily be used? At a funeral. What is a caretaker? A caretaker is somebody um, that presides over the dead. There is all this language all throughout the text that relate to death and the dead. Whether it's those uh, couple of examples that I just gave you, whether it's uh, references to coffins, or it's the snow or ash, the, the symbolism of the snow could very well represent ash, uh, something pertaining to death and war, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, within the very language uh, that are used to describe various uh, uh, plot sequences, quote, perished alive, unquote, or, quote, three mortal hours, unquote. So all of these uh, symbols and all of this language pertaining to death and the dead relate to the text's uh, overall enterprise of constructing an Ireland and Irish values that are without life. And we're going to see that not only in the examples that I gave, but in all sorts of different ways as well. So this text embodies all sorts of social critiques um, about Irish society, all sorts of social critiques pertaining to Irish institutions, whether it's family, religion, economics or economic disparity, the different types or caricatures that exist, uh, at least according to the text in Irish society. A critique of women's roles, very traditional in many ways. Um, and, and I want to explore some of these just for a moment. In um, my anthology, the Norton Anthology of World Literature, Volume 2, Shorter, Fourth Edition, I am on page 978. And one of the institutions that are critiqued, as I said, is religion. And I just want to read uh, a portion here, an interaction between Mr. Brown and Mary Jane at the bottom of the page. Oh, most people give some donation to the monastery when they leave, said Mary Jane. I wish they had an institution like that in our church, said Mr. Brown candidly. He was astonished to hear that the monks never spoke, got up at two in the morning, and slept in their coffins. He asked what they did it for. That's the rule of the order, said Aunt Kate firmly. Yes, but why, asked Mr. Brown. Aunt Kate repeated that it was the rule that was all. Uh, so this is a critique of religion. Why is this a critique? Because it's talking about a monastic order that sleeps in their coffins. What do we use coffins for? What do people use coffins for? For the dead. So this then is a symbol, again, reinforcing the overall or over arching symbolism of death and all of the different aspects in this text. In addition, this scene, I think, suggests that religion is dead. It's not changing. It's not dynamic. It's not fitting the needs of the people at this particular moment in time. And we'll, we'll talk about war uh, a little bit later, but it doesn't fit the needs. Why do the monks sleep in the coffins? Because that's what they do. Well, why do they do that? Because that's what they do. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to people that uh, might be following this. That's just something that they do. So a critique of religion. This text uh, provokes a critique of Irish types. It creates a kind of typology. This is uh, the dutiful son. This is the drunken Irishman. And who is the drunken Irishman in this text? Our good friend, Freddie Malins. You know Freddie. Everybody knows a Freddie. You don't want him at your party, but you bring him, and then he does something silly, and you have something to talk about 
afterwards, right? Freddie has too much to drink. Hopefully, he has a designated driver, and hopefully, he doesn't puke uh, on your carpet or in your car. Why is Freddie a kind of caricature? Well, look at his description on page 968 at the bottom of the page. In fact, right behind her, Gabriel could see piloting Freddie Malins across the landing. <clears throat> the later, a young man of 40, was of Gabriel's size and build with very round shoulders. His face was fleshy and pallid, touched with color only at the thick hanging lobes of his ears and at the wide wings of his nose. He had coarse features, a blunt nose, a convex and receding brow, tumid and protruded lips. If you tried to construct Freddie Malins, a sculpture of him, you'd probably come up with like a Mr. Potato Head. I mean, his features are very, uh, they're extreme. Freddie Malins is the drunken Irishman. And this is, this is maybe the best line, one, well, one of the best lines of the entire text. And this is funny. So you want, might want to write this down because sometimes, you know, you look at a story that was published, uh, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, whatnot. And you're like, I don't find it this funny at all. This part is funny. It's about as good as it gets. On page 969, um, there uh, we see Freddie, Ma uh, Freddie Malins in action. Uh, in the paragraph just before the section break, Mr. Brown, whose face was once more wrinkling with mirth, poured out for himself a glass of whiskey, while Freddie Malins exploded before he had well reached the climax of his story and a kink of high-pitched bronchitic laughter and then setting down his untasted and overflowing glass, began to rub the knuckles of his left fist backwards and forwards into his left eye, repeating words of his last phrase, as well as his fit of laughter would allow him. What a great scene here, right? Freddie Malins is telling people a story, and he breaks out into a bronchitic laughter, right? In his chest, he hasn't told the punchline of the story. He's the only person who thinks the story is funny and he starts laughing and everyone's like, uh, yeah, whatever, dude, what's going on here? No one gets it except for Freddie Malins. Okay. So this is, I think, a very funny moment in the text, but also it's a kind of social critique of the kinds of people this text is, uh, describing here. Um, okay. And then finally, um, there is here, um, there's a general critique of society. And uh, an interesting scene here, I think, on page 976. A lot of detail here. I'm going to read a portion of this long paragraph. This is a description of the table, right? So, right, the scene here, we're, we're at Christmas time. Family and friends come together once a year. Uh, to discuss, uh, you know, to get together and and uh, reconnect and all of those sorts of things. And I just want to describe uh, or, or read part of this paragraph on page 976. This is a description of the table after it has been set before the meal. A fat brown goose lay at one end of the table and at the other end on a bed of creased paper strewn with sprigs of parsley lay a great ham stripped of its outer skin and peppered over with crust crumbs, a neat paper frill round its shin, and beside this was a round of spiced beef. Between these rival ends ran parallel lines of side dishes, two little minsters of jelly, red and yellow, a shallow dish full of blocks of blanc mange and red jam, a large green leaf shaped dish with a stalk shaped handle on which lay bunches of purple raisins and peeled almonds, a companion dish on which lay a solid rectangle of Smyrna figs, a dish of custard topped with grated nutmeg, a small bowl full of chocolates and sweet wrapped in gold and silver papers, and a glass vase in which stood some tall celery stalks. Okay, I'll, I'll let you finish reading this. How does this description embody a social critique? Words have meaning, and we have to pay attention to the details here. If we look at words such as parallel lines, rival, centuries, squads, what kind of language is this? This is the language 
of war. This is the language of antagonism. This is the language of people against other people. So we're going to talk about war in just a few minutes. And, and this is, so Dubliners, the short story collection with which the dead was the last story. This is published in 1914. This is at the beginning of World War I. So war is on everybody's mind. But this is not just Ireland slash Britain, uh, you know, part of the Allied powers and whatnot. This is also about people in Ireland and values going to war with one another. I said earlier that this short story is full of images of death. This particular moment is almost full of life. There's red and silver and gold and yellow. It is here on the table with all of this food that life here exists, as opposed to the absence of life at this party or in this society. Okay, and let me just um, uh, continue with this idea of a social critique. Music in this text plays, I think, an important role. And what is music? Why do we listen to music? We listen to music to inspire uh, ourselves, to, to think about a lost love, um, to uh, motivate us uh, during a workout, uh, to relax us, uh, to distract us from, uh, from other things that we might be thinking of. So what can we say about music? Music is about life. And there's a lot of talk in this text about tenors and, and opera singers and, and whatnot. Many of them are not Irish. So there's this kind of antagonism or this dichotomy between uh, opera singers and performers who are Irish and those that are not Irish. So this feeds into the you know, sort of nationalistic antagonism that this text is, uh, is portraying as we see through Gabriel Ireland versus the continent. Importantly, as I said a moment ago, music is about life. But in this text, music can also be death. And on page 969, at the beginning of the new section, let me just read a portion here. Gabriel could not listen while Mary Jane was playing her academy piece full of runs and difficult passages to the hushed drawing room. He liked music, but the piece she was playing had no melody for him, and he doubted whether it had any melody for the other listeners, though they had begged Mary Jane to play something. What is this about? She's playing something very technical. Maybe she's going up and down uh, the keys, and she's producing music, but it's music that is deaf. Okay, so again, a, a social critique, and uh, you know, overall about uh, the symbolism of death in Irish society and its values. We can think about this text in terms of the inner life and uh, the outer life, the, the sorts of masks that uh, we often wear. And we see that here again in this text. I mean, Gabriel's role here is he is expected every year to give the holiday speech and he's expected to, you know, to give a performance here and uphold Irish values and sp speak about the importance of family. But we know Gabriel doesn't really feel all these things. So what does this, what does this create? This creates, I think, a kind of alienation, a separation between uh, Gabriel and the people that he is interacting with, as well as between Gabriel and his wife. And so on page 980, when he begins his speech, he says, in the middle of the page, a new generation is growing up in our midst. In our midst, a generation actuated by new ideas and new principles. It is serious and enthusiastic for these new ideas and its enthusiasm, even when it is misdirected, is, I believe, is the main sincere. But we are living in a skeptical, and if I may use the phrase, a thought-tormented age. And sometimes I fear that this new generation, educated or hyper-educated as it is, will lack those qualities of humanity. He calls this that they're living in a less spacious age. And at the bottom of this paragraph, 
that in gatherings such as this, we shall still speak of them with pride and affection, still cherish in our hearts the memory of those dead and gone great ones whose fame the world will not willingly let die. Well, Gabriel doesn't really feel this way. He feels that Irish society is oppressive, that it is restrictive and prohibitive. And yet that's his, you know, that's his inner life and his outer life has to portray that Gabriel is the upholder, that he is upholding these traditional Irish values. Again, what does this, what does this suggest here? Well, this suggests the real antagonism an inability to reconcile the new and the old together, the old Irish, let's say old or traditional Irish values and modernity. And it, I think it suggests that it's an alienation that Gabriel is feeling that separates him from the rest of his friends and family. Okay, so as I've mentioned uh, in several earlier comments, uh, the text and its relationship to war. Um, this is the beginning of World War I. This is a war that uh, the United States did not get involved in until 1917, but Americans enrolled in foreign armies and, uh, you know, to, to be an ambul uh, ambulatory uh, service. Uh, this was a war that people, uh, you know, uh, idealized in some way that they wanted to stop evil. And what was it that they found? Horror, terror, destruction. There was machine guns and tanks and phosphine gas and chlorine gas and mustard gas and all of these sorts of things. Ireland is not an independent country. We are two years away. This is 1914. We're two years away from 1916, Easter Rising 1916. We are eight years away or so from uh, a civil war where Ireland is trying to break away uh, from British rule. Uh, I just wanted to read here a portion of Easter Rising 1916 by William Butler Yeats, a very famous Irish poet of the early 20th century um, who, who collected folk tales and folk songs and, and gathered them up to, to be uh, immortalized. And, and his poetry had to deal with mythology and Irish history and, and all sorts of different things. But uh, this poem is about the rising from 1916, just as a way to exemplify the power of this historical moment in the early 20th century. I write it out in a verse, McDonough and McBride and Connolly and Paris, now and in time to be, wherever green is warned, are changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. That line, are changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. Very, very famous lines uh, in uh, Irish literature, very famous lines in, in English literature, I think, uh, in general. Um, so this, this exemplifies the importance of this historical moment. And in modernism, the early 20th century, uh, whether we're talking about Virginia Woolf or uh, Gertrude Stein or Pablo Picasso or Ernest Hemingway, uh, war is everywhere. And this is certainly on the mind of James Joyce. When World War I started, um, and this Easter Rising in 1916, what it was was that um, uh, many of the British regulars and many of the men, Irish men in Ireland, went to fight or had to fight with the British. And uh, people that were left behind in Ireland uh, staged this uprising, you know, hoping that they could uh, take a stand and break away from British rule, and that and that failed. And, and many of these very popular leaders uh, were captured and executed and, and that sort of thing. This is the, the subtext uh, of James Joyce's The Dead. And its relationship to modernism, I think, is important. Modernism being the literary genre uh, that James Joyce is, is in part a pioneer of. Uh, how this text fix, uh, fits into that tradition. And I think that is important for us to consider. So I think we have these, you know, very large, uh, overarching themes pertaining to war and modernism and cultural values and and all of those sorts of things. And then we have the the, the very specific story that is being told here. Um, and and to sort of summarize that, I think we're talking about love. We're talking about the love that Gabriel feels 
for his wife, Greta. And this is where I think this gets really complicated in many, many ways. It, it almost, it, it's very difficult to get our heads and our arms uh, wrapped around this. So let's see if we can, you know, sort of summarize some of this. Uh, in this text, uh, you know, to, to think about language, music, uh, as I've mentioned before, painting. These are ways with which we communicate. And we use language to communicate. I mean, that's maybe our best tool, but we know that uh, speaking doesn't always get it done, that we get misunderstood. So we write things. And when we write things, we can be misunderstood or we don't have the words to describe that there's a, a kind of limit to language that we cannot get out of our bodies, out of our heads, the things that we really want to communicate. Because many of the things that we want to communicate are not, are, are, are not verbal. They're effective, they're emotional. And we use language to describe those things. What are other ways that we can communicate? Uh, we use symbol. We use different kinds of code. Do those things clarify the message? Well, in many ways, they make the message more complicated. So let me point out, I think, a very important allusion to this text. On page 969, there is an allusion to Romeo and Juliet. Last paragraph of the uh, page, Gabriel's eyes irritated by the floor, which is kind of interesting, both within the text that Gabriel's feeling irritation. The, this is just after the Academy music that has no life to it, but it's his eyes that are irritated. This is also, I think, uh, in, in so many different ways, Gabriel uh, embodies uh, Joyce, you know, we don't, like, we don't like to talk about this is what Joyce is saying about society, but in many ways we can say this is what Joyce is saying about society. Uh, there's so many aspects of this that, that seem as if Joyce is telling this to us directly. Uh, Joyce eventually went blind. Um, and um, uh, so this, in a way, is a kind of nod to that, I think, that, that Gabriel's eyes are irritated as James Joyce's eyes might have been. But here's a very important literary illusion. And when you encounter these things, don't skip them. Don't go, oh, I don't know what this is. I'll look it up later. Look it up then. Look it up at that particular, uh, look it up at uh, that particular moment. Because this is really, I think, central to understanding Greta's relationship with G Gabriel. And what is the literary illusion? It's to, it's, so it's to Romeo and Juliet. The ill-fated love between these two lovers that end in death. Okay, fine. So at the bottom of page 969, Gabriel's eyes irritated by the floor, which glittered with beeswax under the heavy chandelier, wandered to the wall above the piano. A picture of the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet hung there, and beside it was a picture of the two murdered princes in the tower, so on and so forth. Okay, so we have a reference to Romeo and Juliet. This is... Really, and, and, and the point at the bottom of the slide, it's the relationship between art and life and art. This very sort of complex inward, outward mirroring of what is going on uh, here with this uh, literary illusion. So we have the picture of Romeo and Juliet. That is art. Well, we have a scene in the text that we're going to call the Romeo and Juliet scene on page 984, Gabriel is looking up at Greta. And this happens in more, more, than, in, in, in more than one place in this text, but this is the central moment. Gabriel is at the bottom of the stairs looking up at Greta, his wife. This is a replication of the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet, keeping in mind that the text itself is art. So Romeo and Juliet, there's a picture of Romeo and Juliet, art, imitating life, the real scene of what happens between these two characters. And then we step back and go, okay, art, imitating life, but that life is really a mirroring of, you know, within an art piece itself. So it really becomes, I think, the relationships here become really complex. So 
communication here is just about clarity. You know, each sort of level that we step back, I think it becomes less clear. The message is less streamlined and it becomes much more open to interpretation. And in many ways, it becomes more confusing. So Gabriel is looking up at his wife and what does he think to himself? If, uh, and it says here on page 984, um, in the paragraph beginning, he stood still in the gloom. Um, there was grace and mystery in her attitude as if she were a symbol of something. He doesn't know. He's confused. Rather than saying, this is my wife at the top of the stairs and I love her so much and, and I'm going to make it clear to her that I love her, he says, you know what? I'd paint a picture. In this picture, I would call distant music. So back to the music theme. And where does... You know, the, the, the title of the art piece that Gabriel fantasizes about painting, music, is death. Because music in this text, in many ways, is about death. Okay, but there's more to this. Because if we stay on this idea of communication through art, well, there's a song that Greta is listening to. She doesn't notice her husband at the bottom of the stairs. What is the song that she's listen, listening to? It's an old Irish and British ballad called The Lass of Algram. It's a beautiful song. I highly recommend that you look it up on YouTube and listen to it. It's about the lass of Algram, this young woman who has a love affair with Sir Gregory, and then they separate. And this you know, person who's uh, presumably poor has a child and comes to the tower where Sir Gregory lives and says, Sir Gregory, would you please let me in? And he says, no. And it's a beautiful and tragic song. So you have the illusion of Romeo and Juliet. Then you have the duplication or the replication of the scene of Romeo and Juliet at this particular moment. You have Gabriel suggesting a title which refers to music. So this is all symbolic. It's moving further and further away from clarity, and it becomes much more open to interpretation. And this other allusion to the lass of Algram has to do with tragic love, which is how the story is going to end when Gabriel wants to make love to his wife and tell her how much he loves her. And he's thinking, of, and she, excuse me, she is thinking about Michael Fury. Michael Fury is a young man in Greta's, uh, when Greta was a young woman that was in love with Greta. Now, Gabriel, you know, so this is a story about love, a, a tragic love, a love that no one here has died literally, but I think symbolically. Again, referring to the title, The Dead. And Gabriel wants to be Greta's hero. He says he wants to be heroic. Fight the bad guy. Fight the dragon. Do something wonderful. Something hyper-masculine. So she could fall in love with him again and again. But what could be more heroic than Gabriel, the great chivalrous knight, fighting the dragon? Somebody that dies or your love? How do you compete against that? And that then is the new framework that Gabriel understands his love and his marriage with Greta. Wonderful, horrible, uh, just an incredible, incredible moment in this text. So anyway, uh, the past memory, how does, how does it affect uh, what goes on in the present um, uh, for us to consider anxiety and shame. Uh, and we see a lot of this with Gabriel. There are several fails that he has in this text where he tries to do something, whether it's give money to Lily, the caretaker's daughter, or his uncertainty. I mean, this, this makes Gabriel very much uh, in, the same, uh, in the same fabric as, let's say, T.S. Eliot's and the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, this, uh, you know, we're not the great heroes uh, of, 
uh, you know, uh, of the ancient world. We're not Odysseus. We're not Hector. We're not Achilles. We're just normal people, and we are afraid, and we are anxious, and we are worried, and Gabriel embodies this. And so I think, you know, fairly simply here, and I, and I think I've just, you know, touched on some of the sort of complexity here, but to sum it up in, in a simplified way that this text is about the desire for connection and in modernity, in the modern world. And I say the modern world, maybe both today, but also in the time of this text, it's, it's about disconnection. It's about Gabriel's disconnection to his wife, about Gabriel's disconnection to his family, about Gabriel's disconnection to his culture. And I think in many ways, it's about Gabriel's disconnect with himself. And that, I think, <clears throat> relates to the dead and death. And uh, there's really no resolution at the end of this text. We see uh, Gabriel walking to a window, looking out, which is an important symbol in this text because people are looking out windows as a kind of fantasy or desire to be in another space rather than the space that you are occupying. So the, the story ends with Gabriel looking out the window and snow falling over everything. Relationship between the living and the dead and much that is portrayed in this text is about the dead. Okay, well, I have an introductory paragraph and a thesis for a possible paper. Uh, this might sound a little familiar with some of the comments that I've made thus far in my wrap-up thoughts of James Joyce's The Dead. I want us to pay attention to a couple of things. One, uh, that The Dead is a short story, and even though it's a long short story, that short works are enclosed by quotation marks. If it was a movie I was speaking of or a novel, then that would be italicized. So it's important for us to know the format and how to present this. I use a variety of different sentences. I use uh, at least one, uh, at least one uh, transition word. And I'm starting very broad. I'm starting conversational. I'm grabbing your attention, I hope. And I'm working my way down to the specifics of the, uh, excuse me, I'm starting very broad. I'm working my way down to then introducing the short story and then the very specifics of what my argument is going to be about if I were to write a paper. There are moments in history that alter the ways with which we think about the world we live in, where everything we thought we knew is now changed. However, it is sometimes difficult to conceive other periods in history in the same way. For as Frank Kermode has written, we exist in the middle. We are always in the middle of our own stories. Like experiencing coronavirus, the financial meltdown of 2008, and 9-11. Our understanding of our place, our security, and our sense of selves has been altered. And these experiences are played out in billions of individual stories. The modernist moment in the early 20th century was one such period that was worked and reworked in modernist literature. Particularly, we see the destructive upheaval of life and love in James Joyce's short story, The Dead. There was the possibility of real death in the form of World War I and Irish and British upheaval and violence over independence. More importantly, Gabriel Conroy's newly understood distance between him and his wife Greta, another kind of death, Lime, the disconnectedness of self in the context of a dehumanizing, uncertain, and violent geopolitical and psychological space. So again, <clears throat> starting very broad and conversational, working my way down to uh, introducing the story that I'm going to be handling in the paper, working my way down to a thesis, a variety of different sentences, a variety of different punctuation, strategies, uh, conjunctive adverbs, transition words, all of these different things I'm working towards clarity and to create interest. And that is the end. Thank you.